Um, let me go into a little bit about me. Uh, uh, just, I don't know many of you, and so I, I thought it might be helpful. I'm a local here, uh, actually a native Texan as well. Happy to be back in Texas the last 10 years or so. Um, I did get my start in the defense industry, but I'm now at Proofpoint, so I've shifted gears into tech and uh, have been in tech now for uh, about 10, uh, 12 years or so. Um, I, there's some other fun facts in here about me, but the most important thing I, I want to mention before I hop into the, the topic today is I am also not a history buff. Um, what I have come to appreciate as I'm aging is that there are a lot of people that have gone before me that have faced challenges similar, maybe not the same, but similar to what I face and have a lot to teach me. And seeing history through the eyes of an individual as opposed to you know, facts on a page has really helped me to appreciate that. So I hope you grow in your appreciation of history even as I apply one small lesson here. And, uh, and let me just put a couple disclaimers. These are important. I'll let you read them. The, the mic seems to be going in and out. Do I need to keep it? This is uh, the, 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 uh, okay. the lab will compensate for that. All right. Well, let me set the stage. Go with me in your minds to go with. Are we still on? Go with me. I'll speak up. And go, Go with me in your minds to 1968. We've been conducting operations in Vietnam now for three years, since 1965, in what's been called Operation Rolling Thunder. A million sorties of aircraft, which doesn't mean one aircraft, it's multiple, have flown at this point in time. And unfortunately, the losses of American pilots and aircraft have continued to mount. In fact, at this point, there are nearly a thousand that have been lost, which is a crazy high number. And to help, help drive this particular point home, re remember that every one of those aircraft is a two-seater. If you look at the F4 Phantom in the upper right corner. So every aircraft loss actually means twice the number of losses of personnel. And that's a big deal. These are junior officers. These are mid-grade officers. Years of training and investment by the, by the US military, and lots of practice, camaraderie, folks not returning home from missions, families back at home that don't see their loved one again, children, etc. This is a big deal. A number like 1,000 may not seem like a big deal. It's a really big deal when losses get to this point, and it, it's such a big deal that that number has actually, it, it's in front of the Chief of Naval Operations desk. The most senior Navy official is concerned about these numbers, and he calls for a sweeping investigation into the root cause behind these issues. In particular, the thought was that there's something wrong with the air-to-air -air missiles, and that was really supposed to be the focus of this report. The order goes to a captain by the name of Frank Alt to, to do this review, pull in other people to help, and, and pull together root causes and recommendations. And he does that over a three-month period. And in November, the, the results are in, even though the report doesn't get officially published until January. And like any good naval officer, any good executive at your company, as soon as results are in, they want to know, right? Like, what, how bad is it? What are the root causes? What are the recommendations? And, and there was so much in this report that the CNO himself decides it's time to stop operations. We need a get well plan, and I don't want to send any more of my, my troops, if you will, uh, onto the front lines like this until we've made some amends. It was a really big deal. That report, the ALT report, had 14 recommendations and a lot of supporting data. What was in it? Well, the Navy keyed in on two of them. The, the first was, there actually was a problem with the missiles. And it wasn't necessarily just the missile tech. It was the whole supply chain. These, these had been rushed into service 
in order to support the war effort. And so there have been a number of shortcuts all the way through the procurement process in order to get them um, mass produced and shipped overseas. So there actually needed to be some work done to kind of go back and retrofit some of these just standard procurement kind of practices and do a better job with these missiles. But the, the second part is the part that we all know as the Top Gun School. There was a recommendation that said, you, even though the missiles are buggy, our pilots actually need better training and practice on the proper angles of attack to use, you know, all the parameters about how far away or how close and so forth. That's what's known as the weapons envelope, right? Where, what are the parameters for properly using them and to get really good at it? You all have seen that on television. What you haven't seen is this whole report and the unsung hero that I'm going to talk about next. He's the one that got the order to set up that school. And be before I show you his picture, I just want to highlight something. If you look at the left and you look at the right, you'll realize that the Navy's focus was, let's reduce risk by following rules better. Let me say that a little, a little louder so it comes through. Let's reduce risk by following rules better. Rules better in procurement and rules better in the field. Here's the gentleman who got the order from the CNO to establish that fighter weapons school that we now know as Top Gun. Commander, or Lieutenant Commander Peterson. He was a command pilot. So he's not only flown these missions, but he's had folks under his command that didn't return home. He has peers in other squadrons that are flying missions or that have folks that, that have lost. So you've got to you've got to kind of feel, put yourself in this gentleman's shoes for just a minute. He's carrying the weight, if you will, like I really need to help pilots, my, my fellow pilots. What do I need to do? How do I need to train them in order to accomplish the mission? And the, the order he got was another risk-based order. The order was, don't lose another airplane and don't lose another person. And you can understand why, right? I mean, it's totally reasonable. Our get well plan shouldn't also result in additional losses like we've been having in the field. Colonel Peterson had to, had, had to think, if you will, again, putting yourself in his shoes. What, what would best help these folks? I mean, these are, these are real people, right? not just faces in a picture, real people that, that he wanted to make successful in their mission, but also bring them home safely. And here's, here's why he's the unsung hero. He had a very creative solution in, in surveying the all report, all the data, and knowing what he knew of his fellow pilots. The first was that the primary cause of the losses wasn't the technology problem, the primary cause was that the pilots were too rules-bound, too rules-based. In fact, they were so rules-based, even in their tactics, that the enemy had learned them and used it against them, right? By, by them following the rules, it actually gave a playbook to the enemy of what they could expect when I do A, they're going to do B, and then I, I counter with C, and the uh, engage, engagement is finished. So instead of focusing on rules, as he was told, yes, he was going to teach them how to fly the missions and use the weapons properly, but he wanted to teach them to expect the unexpected. In other words, to treat, to, to treat failure as routine, to get used to things failing, and get really good at detecting failure and responding to it. Detect, adapt, detect, adapt. And by doing that over and over in training, the goal was that when they're... I'm sorry, this is going in and out. Look, can, can I just talk over there? Want to just, just put it on stand? Put, put, that, put that on stand. Yeah, and then the lot will pick it up. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so by embracing the unexpected, the point was your, your weapon systems, they're, they're mechanical, they're, they're complex systems. Your, your aircraft is complex, it's made to fail, right? At, at some point, they're so complex, they're not going to work perfectly. 
And your enemy may have tactics that are better than you, or one pilot is this ace in the other side, and you don't know who's sitting on the other side of the, of the cockpit as you're going head to head. He wanted them to adapt quickly and rapidly and expect these kinds of things to happen in the field. And by treating failure as routine, these pilots saw an incredibly high increase in their effectiveness when they did return two years later to uh, the, the, the air operations in Vietnam. Their, their kill rates went up five times what they were before for the same number of US aircraft losses. It was deemed an incredible success and largely owing to Peterson's teaching them how to quickly adapt to failure. Now, you know this is a talk on CICD security. So thank you for bearing with me if you're not a history person yourself. Um, there are a lot of lessons, I think, that can be gleaned from that account that I just told you, not only from Lieutenant Commander Peterson, but also all the way up to the CNO. And I'm going to try to make those ties here, because those lessons helped me uh, on my journey in the last couple years on a focus of uh, improving the security of our pipelines at Proofpoint. All right, so I'm going to hit one right up front. Supply chain matters, right? There was actually a supply chain problem that contributed to a quality problem that contributed to the problems in the field. And speed, as you all know, at some point can outpace quality. We, that we are always like in this balance. I want to move faster and I want to move faster, but that, that can't ultimately be at the point of cutting so many corners that what we deliver fast isn't good, right? That, that, that's kind of this, this balancing act and trade-off. We, the, what I want to do is plug DevOps here for this reason. DevOps, I, what I love about the model is that the effect in the field, the effect to customers, is felt very, very quickly by the very folks who can do something about it and rapidly in, uh, improve and adapt and push the fixes to help those customers. You, you following me? In the defense world, the person that, that put the specs together and designed these air-to-air uh, -air missiles, the AIM-9s and the AIM-7s, they did that years before they ever hit the fields. They're a different team than the test team, a different team than the manufacturing team, et cetera, et cetera, right? They don't feel those effects unless somebody makes them feel the effects, right, and passes it all the way back. DevOps is a wonderful model for rapidly adapting. But for lessons two and three, I'm going to have to cover some basics. So again, I'm going to ask, please bear with me. Um, as I, in order to explain some of this, I have to put some things in place that may not perfectly map to your model of a pipeline. There, it's going to be a little abstract, but just stick with me here as I build this up. You know, it, in, a, in a pipeline, you've got to transform code into something that's going to deliver value to a customer, right? So in order to build, whether that's assemble, compile, or some combination, in order to build, I have to have source code that I pull from. I have to have a package system that I push things to and, and possibly pull things from, like, right, for third-party dependencies. And then I have to have some way to deploy this. And the deploy, I just list here as a different function. It doesn't have to be a different system. But the deploy has a very different role of moving things from one environment to another and, and looking at the output of all the tests that are happening and so forth. It's, it's really a different role than build. So a pipeline, for the purpose of our discussion here, is this thread. It's not necessarily a linear thread, but it's a thread. Source code to production. Source code to production. Let me make this a little more realistic, because we know we know we have multiple branches over here on the left, right? It's not this just monolithic source code repo. We've got different branches with different qualities to them. We've got different environments on the right. As we move, let, let's, let's consider feature as anything that isn't a protected branch. So not, not main, not release. Main, then, as we start moving closer to prod, we're, we're moving higher and higher into uh, our environments on the right. 
And by the time we get to deployments to prod, we don't have to go all the way back and rebuild things. We just grab the stuff that's passed all the tests at the previous stages and push it to prod. I do want to say I'm purposefully doing a very non-traditional OWASP CI CD security talk. I'm not talking about how to hook in SEA or get the fastest results from SAST and how to plug all that in. I really do just want to talk about the core security properties of this thing from end to end. OK, so you got a pipeline. We all know controls matter, right? And I'm just going to pick a few objectives. This isn't comprehensive, but we know we want peer review, code review to happen for source code. So what kinds of things can we employ there? We've got branch protection. We've got pull request policies about how many reviewers. Um, even if you've, if you've got code owner's files, who the cognizant people are that need to be in that review at a minimum. And, um, and things like pipeline as code, which I'll highlight later, by doing pipeline as code and getting a review, we're actually impacting later systems with a control in an earlier system. When we move to build systems, we, we get into, uh, let's call this, my objective is con config managed. Uh, there are many more, but just config managed can be a huge step for a lot of us. I don't know how, maybe, maybe you're different, I don't know how many Jenkins systems I've looked at, and I asked the folks, could you redeploy that over to this environment tomorrow? And the answer is no, right? There's no way. We've, we don't even necessarily know all the plugins that are installed and how those got there and who's using. I don't even know if someone's using that plugin anymore. Um, how reproducible is this? Uh, not at all. So let, let's just say config manage is very important for a build system. Well, that, that can lead me to things like agents, agent images, right, that are uh, that I always get the exact same agent image that, uh, that spins up and runs. It can lead me to use of supported tools. How many of you have seen Ant and Maven and Gradle kind of tool chains that are 10, 15 years old? Um, it, it can also lead me to things like approved plugins, the things that help with the build system. Uh, can, in many ways, introduce vulnerabilities themselves, but I, I want this thing to be well config managed. In the package system, I want to pose curated as my objective. I don't just want any third party package making it into my production software. And I say curated on purpose. It doesn't necessarily mean human review. But something is looking at this thing and saying, OK, that's an, that's an OK public registry to pull from. This particular package meets whatever criteria for um, their mean time to repair vulnerabilities when they're reported, their push rate you know, or commit rate, right? These things that kind of indicate that it's actively maintained. Whatever those criteria are for your free and open source software. Here you can pull in things like vulnerability scanning for those third party things as well and highlight versions that are not safe to use. And, um, and even have this concept of immutable tags or different folder hierarchies, maybe even different package systems depending on which environment you're headed to. And at deploy, you, you all know this, there, there are so many checks that happen at deploy time. Let's call this one policy compliance, right? Whatever the broad policy is for security policy, I want to make sure that earlier stages did what they were supposed to. And whatever I need to do at my stage, I do before pushing. OK. And underlying all of this is just common application security controls. So let me, let me give you some lists. If, if you haven't seen the OWASP top 10 CI CD security risks as a set of risks and corresponding controls, it is well worth a read. They cover some stuff in there that you won't find in a lot of other places on, on uh, pipeline security. The, I'm going to talk a whole lot about flow control and about logs in the remainder of the talk. Let me, let me highlight a couple others that are listed here. There's poisoned pipeline execution. You all know, every, every time you pull things into some place to, to do work on it, it's an opportunity for that tool to cache it in order to try to improve performance. And now you've got a cache that can be poisoned and, and could influence future builds. So Gradle, Maven do this. Git, when you clone a repo, if it doesn't get blown away or, or it's not an ephemeral agent that destroys all of that cache, 
it's very easy for one pipeline to influence a future pipeline run or one pipeline to influence another pipeline's run. In fact, just, just as an example here uh, on this point, um, th this is a little bit of a cash, a, a cash kind of example. I remember working with a dev who um, we were trying to investigate if a reported vulnerability um, what was actually the fault of his software or a third, a third module that he pulled in from somewhere else in the company. And, uh, and he's like, I, I can't access the source code in the source code repo. And his friend pops up and says, oh, but I can get it. We just need to go to the build agent. And all of the, all of the repos are cloned there. And the access control that's on the source code system isn't enforced there in the build system. And they looked at the code and helped me solve. I was really happy because we got the answer we needed. But it, it highlights like these caches exist, right? If, if you don't actively manage um, their presence or their absence. And one other I'll, I'll highlight here, I, I, I'm not going to talk about SAS, but a lot of those boxes that I showed in the previous diagram aren't necessarily self-hosted, right? You might self-host Jenkins, but other people might be using Circle CI. In fact, I'm kind of looking around them. Maybe use GitHub for your source code management. All of those third-party things um, have to be managed very, very carefully in the same way as you might on-prem, um, and, and perhaps with even some additional security controls since they're so publicly accessible. So anyway, the, the risks, talk about that. Uh, it's, a, it's really well done and a good read. They actually refer to Salsa in one of the controls um, in, in terms of this provenance generation and verification. Just to show of hands, who's familiar with Salsa? The, it's a Linux Foundation project. OK, I see a, a few hands. Um, their focus is a little different in that they're not focused on the whole pipeline, but really on, on these controls that help with, with taking source code and third-party packages and getting them in a shape where, where when you build, you've got all the evidence of what builder did the work, where did all the packages get pulled from. It's not SBOM. It, it really is this signed metadata about an artifact that later stages in pipelines can use to verify that these things came through the right path in, this, in the CI-CD chain. Well worth the read, too. Uh, what, what we've ended up doing is combining controls out of these various um, projects in order to come up with what best suited our needs. OK. Apparent challenges. If you hadn't noticed in looking at those boxes, Software supply chain affects everything. It, it, we're not just talking Node packages and Python packages and RPMs. Jenkins itself is third party. GitHub is third party. Bitbucket, if you've got that on, on, on all of these things, none of us writes it, right? It's not core to our business. It doesn't contribute any value. Why would we invest time to write these things? So this is not a talk on third party risk management, but but it does, uh, I'll just say this, it is important that these things are part of third-party risk management. And somebody's doing the due diligence to look into the products and their maintainability, supported versions, all that kind of thing. The second, this is complex. All I highlighted was one mi microservice, let's say pipeline. You probably have hundreds, thousands of these. The, the number in my company well exceeds the numbers I've just tossed out. And, and you might not just have one build system and source code management system, but multiple. And so the, the, the number of integrations between these things, the flows, it is a complex system of systems. I used to work on these kind of systems in the defense industry. And it was well known that it is nearly impossible to secure a complex system of systems. It can be done with a lot of money and a lot of time. But for most of us, that's impractical, right? You can get so far, and then there's still going to be a lot of uh, a decent amount of risk that, that you can't quite address. And I, I, I'm, I don't want to leave you like despairing at this point, because admiration of the problem isn't really the solution, right? I, I'm going to turn the corner here in just a sec. And, and help show how we can actually 
find and address some of these risks. Um, third, I highlighted a minute ago in my example how access control in one system actually needed to span into some other systems where there were these bypass paths. If I can, I can access code in the source code management system, but I can access another person's code through the build agent, then uh, I've got an access control problem, right? So there is this kind of interdependency. Identity is one of them, access management is another, and, and the lists keep going, uh, as we'll soon see. And then finally, from my defense background, verification of a security design is, is equally important, if not more important, than the actual spec, right, of, of what needs to be done. If I can't demonstrate or test and verify that this thing is working properly, I'm, I can't actually conclude that I've done a good enough job. Let me talk about a couple of bypass examples to help illustrate this verify proper behavior problem. All right, so code review. If my objective is still to do this, this peer review before code gets into the main branch, but a feature branch build is able to push a package into a stage or prod location, guess what happens on a next deployment to prod or stage? It's now pulling a package that hasn't been through code review. Are you guys following? You following the bypass? I'll highlight before I move on to the next slide, equally here you can run into privilege escalation problems where a feature branch, if it has a pipeline as code, I can now make a change to my pipeline and get it to execute on a build agent, and then I can withdraw my pull request. So I've, I've effectively taken privilege that I don't have and leverage the build system's privileges to do things in other systems within the environment. The, and, and these we're just touching the tip of the iceberg. Let, let me highlight another one here. What, what about this one where I only want main branch builds because they're, they're, it's the integration branch, right? It's supposed to only go to stage and prod. But if my main branch build can pull packages from a dev location or from the internet, I've totally bypassed the package management and, and code review, curation kind of aspect of the, the flow control I was hoping for. Okay, I, I think this one's a little more apparent. But walk, walk with me, here's the challenge. I want you to walk with me for just a sec. How would you detect this if you were looking at logs? Think about it for a minute. If you look at the package system logs, it's only gonna know which build service account did the write, or the, in this case, the read, and it's gonna know which, uh, which package was read, but that's all it knows, so it doesn't have the context. There's no way to just look at package system logs and detect this. If you look at the build system logs, you have a little bit more context, because you know which branch this, this pipeline was executing from, and you know where things were written, but without making assumptions, you don't know that that target branch is an unauthorized, or is target, target location on the right is an unauthorized location, and you don't really know that main is a protected branch. It could be a misnamed branch. Master might be the, the protected branch, and somebody has main, right? That you don't really know the detail over there if you just look at the build system logs. And you get less information if you look at the source code logs. You, you, you get your branch protection kind of stuff, but you don't necessarily know all the detail about the package system on the right. So it's very hard to detect these kind of cross-system flow violations just by looking at one system's logs in isolation. Okay, here now, I'm gonna to try to tie some of these things together. Thank you for bearing with me. Here now is lesson two, and this was a huge aha moment for me. Yes, I can design flow control, and I, I need to have those, and I need to have basic controls in place in my pipelines. But like Commander Peterson, I want to train my own AppSec team to be ready for failure and to learn how to quickly detect it and adapt to it. 
and to do that both in small ways and in larger. So in order to detect pipeline flow violations like this, the first thing is I, I need to grab logs from all of these systems, not just from one in isolation, and get them in one place where I can compare and correlate and aggregate those logs. So that's part one. I realized very quickly, though, normally security folks, we pull in access logs or audit logs, right? That's not enough here. We actually have to pull in build logs, and I have to pull in git commit history. I don't have to know all the code that was changed in the git commit history, necessarily, but I need to know who did the commit and on what branch, and I need to know on the build where it pulled stuff from. And even this isn't enough. I learned I have to enrich that data with some static lookup data that gives even more context about branch main on repo A is protected, right? I've got to be able to look that up rapidly in my sim in order to understand that that build was from a protected branch. Are you all following the logic here? OK. You can pull that in one time. I'm, I'm not saying this. Ideally, this is pulled in periodically so that it's fresh lookup table data. But um, initially, it can just be done as a one-time deal. <clears throat> OK, the third part of detection, then, is creating alerts. I come from a, or, or our product security team is actually situated in ops. So I've come to understand and benefit from ops type thinking about how to build alerts and how to build corresponding playbooks. An, an alert is not just one event. Usually it's a set of events that rise to a level that it makes sense to tell somebody about it, right? It's, it's a group of things. Um, but the way to create these alerts is very manual. It takes analysis. It takes someone to sit down and say, this is the thing I'm looking for. What are the evidence, the types of events that I need to see in logs? Build this whole kind of mechanism to say, well, when you see this alert, here's who to inform. And then here's the playbook. When that person or that group receives the alert, what do they do about it? What do they do to investigate? If they need to investigate, um, what, what uh, steps do they do to contain if it's legitimate? And then, and then how do they adapt? So, so these three here, this is all prep. And I, I, I want to leave you with some really practical examples here. You can actually do this in small slices in order to start getting some quick wins. So you, you don't have to necessarily solve the whole problem. You, you could just focus on one system initially, pull its logs, enrich its an event data, and then build an alert or two off of that. And, and as you start working with this, then start building these out over time. That's, that's our model anyway. We, we don't have the resources to uh, boil the ocean. The, the next set here, though, is the tactical adaptation. So now, as I run the playbook, part of the playbook step is to remediate. So that one pipeline, one branch problem, Here's the point solution. Let's fix that one config so that it's, it doesn't happen again. But that's like whack-a-mole, right? That, that's very tactical. Uh, it, they, they do help, but they're very small wins. That's micro-adaptation. And that's, that's what Colonel Peterson taught his pilots to do, right? In the moment, here's how to adapt quickly. But the more strategic adaptation comes from what we learned from Admiral Moore. He taught that it is worth when you see repeat events or common events in one or, or a whole set of events for one pipeline, it pays to drill in and investigate and find a root cause or causes and then do something about it. That's the strategic adaptation to what's happening in the pipeline that'll, that'll uh, win you huge dividends, much greater than just the tactical ones. So this was my aha moment. My, my very high level model was missing this key component of log analysis and alerts and playbooks, if you will, the ops part of DevOps. OK, I want to give you some ideas of events worth monitoring. If you can only grab stuff from a single system, here's some that you can watch for. Direct commits to a protected branch. Those should never happen. If, if peer review really is a desired control, you always want at least two-person integrity on code changes, 
direct commit shouldn't happen. If they do, and maybe it's an emergency and maybe it's legit, no, no problem, you've investigated, case closed, move on, right? But in many cases, these are not. You have no idea if the person who had these privileges, uh, if their credentials had been compromised and are being used by a third party to make a code change, right? It all looks legit because the username in the log matches a legitimate person. But you don't know without having this kind of detection and quickly investigating. Another that you could do, freestyle jobs in Jenkins. There's, there's no peer review, the kind of feature in Jenkins. So if someone can go in and create a job to do something in Jenkins that uses all of the access and privilege that Jenkins has in your environment, that's a bad day. That this is one that's an easy one. You don't even have to have context here. If you see a freestyle job pop up, somebody go take a look, um, figure out why it, that we don't have pipeline as code being used. And, and I've given a couple other for package and, and so forth. Um, for cross-system events, Here's, here's where things get really interesting. Here's where you can start looking for main branch builds that pull in dev kind of packages that, that haven't been reviewed, or from internet URLs, right, as opposed to from your package system. Here's where you can look for writes from feature branches into stage or prod types of locations for packages. You, you can even go so far as looking in your source code system for pipelines that want to deploy Helm charts to prod with a URL that's internet-based. Who, who hasn't seen that? I, I'm, kind of, I'm going to phrase it that way. Have you seen Helm charts that pull container images from the internet and deploy them directly into your prod Kubernetes environment? It, it happens. These are the kinds of things that you can find in logs. All these odd flow control things, right? That, are unexpected and that to try to, to close all of these down up front would be uh, uh, just very cost prohibitive. Okay, so final lesson and then I wrap up. It does pay to investigate <coughs> systemic problems. Obviously none of the events that we are gonna look at in our SIM tool are gonna rise to the level of what Colonel Moore had to look at, right? The, the, this rising death toll of pilots in combat. But notice the action he took. It's serious, it's happening a lot. I need to find out why and get a get well plan in place. And I hope, you know, we're all DevOps folks, you know, the option to actually say, hey, we need to stop the pipelines for a while because we're really out of whack here in our, on our security posture. I, I hope we never get there because that, mean, that meant we went far fields a whole lot earlier. But, but maybe, the end result is some control changes that have to be very carefully planned out, right? Because it's going to affect the workflow of a lot of teams to change this one control strategically to improve our pipeline security. But you'll have the data, right? You'll have the logs, you'll have the number of events that have contributed to this, even historically, not just you know, point in time. And it helps to make the case for why this change that's going to affect dev workflow and, God forbid, velocity in order to improve things, right? Like, that, that is the end goal. And by making things more secure, ultimately our customers are in a better position in using our products. So uh, the, the last one I want to leave here is creativity. Colonel Peterson was quite creative in, uh, Lieutenant Commander Peterson, was quite creative in the types of solutions that he came up with. So actually was Captain Alt in the recommendations that he put in the report. If you think about the Alt report, it talked about process, supply chain problems. There was tech, so there was a technology problem, but there was also training, and he, so he really did focus on people as well. It, it wasn't strictly in one category. And I would argue that as a general rule, the biggest gains happen in the people category, just like we learned from Colonel or Lieutenant Commander Peterson. Let me give you one example. The culture that we've built at Proofpoint and work really hard to maintain is one where everybody is on the lookout for security issues within the company. So just in the past month, I've had a principal engineer on the engineering team highlight, hey, did you know that I can, and he, he filled in the blank, and it had something to do with a CICD access violation. 
Um, six months before that, another one came to our team and talked about how virtual repos in the package system, that he was accidentally grabbing things from the internet when he thought he was grabbing something from our package system because of the way that the virtual repo in the package system was configured. It was, it's awesome. And that, that's the kind of people and culture change that saves us as security folks so many hours. Like we're not diving into systems to investigate. Some investment here in uh, over time regularly in building that kind of culture now makes everybody basically a, 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 an alert source, right? Because they see an event, they have all the context in mind of what they were, thought they were doing and, or weren't supposed to be able to, to do and an easy, hey, I'm just reporting this, uh, no fault kind of report, right? And, and we can take corrective action, in this case, micro adaptation. So I, I, I wanna leave you with that. Um, thank you, thank you for listening to me. Here's a summary of those three lessons since they were kind of spread out over time. But I hope this was helpful and I hope most of all that it envisioned you for a way to, to get more visibility into what's happening in your pipelines and adapt over time and not be afraid of, uh, of the failures happening. That's all I've got, thank you. <laughs> yeah, um, if the, for the purpose of the video, let me repeat the question. The, the question was, uh, correct me if I don't get this right, any practical advice about standardizing on tools and, and getting buy-in, if you will, across the company on that kind of standardization? Yeah, um, yeah interesting, interesting question. First, can I challenge the question just a little, if you don't mind, the premise of it? Um, I'm not sure that standardization is always the right answer. I do come from a defense background and love standardization, don't get me wrong, but, um, I've also seen the benefit over the last few years of having some flexibility, like if you will, guardrails on the side of the road as opposed to a very prescriptive road, you know, very, very narrow road. Um, so so what, where you might start initially is by establishing guardrails that everybody can agree on. And those are things like, um, we don't wanna use unsupported versions of Ant or Maven or Gradle or you know, whatever the tool chain is. Unsupported meaning you go to the website and they say, we won't issue vulnerability patches for these versions. You know, you're on your own now because we've moved on. I think a lot of people will agree on that because there's non-security benefit to that too, right? Um, another might be vulnerable versions. I, uh, again, a lot of people can understand we don't want to systematically build vulnerabilities in because our tool chain has issues. Um, and, and I think then the next the next conversation after that, after you've run with that for a while is, sheesh, we have a lot of tools. Do we need these all, <laughs> right? And, and make, make it more a people conversation about, um, it, it's hard for security to keep on top of all this. What about you all, right? Like how do you keep abreast of all the patches coming out on these things and, and make sure that you're using the right version? Um, I, t I tend to think of those as people problems more than tech, and, and let's, let's see if we have common ground as a reason to move towards fewer tools, if, the, if that helps you. That is helpful. Yeah, you yeah, sure. That's the main one because, oh, oh so the question was, what, what is the criteria for doing some of these deeper investigations, the, str the strategic ones, right? Um, in my mind, the... It was very expensive. If you think back to the history lesson, the Admiral had to pull a captain out of whatever other stuff he was doing and put him full time on this investigation. The captain himself enlisted the help of about nine different folks, some to go look at procurement, some to go talk, you know, understand pilot usage. I mean, there, there was, you should see the report. I mean, the number of appendices is huge. So it was very expensive. So in my mind, the criteria for triggering one of those is pretty high because the expense is high, right? Like you really wanna make sure we've got a bad problem before launching that deep an investigation. That said, let me, let me give you one other thing I was thinking of in prep for this talk. There are a lot of us that can't, well like we just don't have the, the funds or the, uh, let me just say the resources 
to really improve our pipelines, you know, there might be a lot of resistance, right? Things are working fine. What, what, why do we need to improve these? Focusing on log collection and detecting these flow control types of events can give you the data to go and say, look, we actually have a lot of problems in our pipelines. So in that case, an investigation kind of early on would help. If, does that make sense? So that's not way down the road. That's kind of an upfront after you've got three months runtime or something with the logs and a number of things um, in order to help build the, the case. You have to convince a lot of people to make changes to pipelines, right? I mean, everyone from engineering leaders, product management has to get involved. And if it's a cross BU kind of thing, you're talking to your executive staff, right? Because it's going to compete with other priorities. So, uh, so anyway, I hope that helps.